Good evening. My name is Jason Roy, and I'm a mathematics teacher here at the American School of Bombay. It's really a pleasure to be introducing our next speaker. Doc Dr. Scott McLeod is an associate professor and coordinator of the Educational Administration Program at Iowa State University. He's also the director of the UCEA Center for the Advanced Study of Technology Leadership in Education called CASEL. The United States is only center dedicated to the technology needs of school administrators. Scott was the co-creator of the wildly popular Did You Know Shift Happens video. He, Scott has received numerous national awards for his technology leadership work, including recognitions from the table industry, Phi Delta Kappa, and the National School Boards Association. Dr. McLeod blogs regularly about technology leadership issues at dangerouslyirrelevant.org. I had the pleasure of meeting Scott and learning from him when he came to ASB Unplugged back in 2008. His keynotes and workshops were engaging, interesting, and they made me go back and you know, want to start doing new things in my classroom right away. I was thrilled to learn that he'd be joining us again this year, and he is, and speaking at this event tonight. So without further ado, let's welcome Scott McLeod. Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk to you today about two big shifts that we're seeing in society and one big problem related to schools. And as you think about these two big shifts and this one big problem, I'd like you to consider three essential functions that schools serve in society. Now, schools serve a variety of different functions, of course, but we have three pretty big ones that I think are of relevance tonight. One of them is the function of schools to prepare our students, our graduates, to be socially functional in the world in which they're going to live. The second essential function, of course, is that we want our graduates to be masters of the dominant information landscape of their time. And the third essential function is that we want our graduates to be economically productive. In other words, we don't want them to live in our basement until they're 40. <laughs> we want them to be contributing members to society and be able to make a living and raise a family and so on. The first big shift that we're seeing is economic. One of the things that is occurring right now is that we're seeing the disappearance of fungible manual labor jobs from what the economists call the advanced countries. So United States, Europe, Japan, Australia, and so on. Uh, these jobs are jobs that don't require a lot of skill or education. They literally can be done by just about anybody. And with just a couple of days of training, you're off and running. These are the classic factory jobs. And what we're finding is that the average factory worker in the US, France, or Japan makes between $20 and $25 an hour. In Mexico or Korea or Taiwan, they make between $5 and $15 an hour. And in India and China, they average less than a dollar an hour. It's very easy to see why these jobs are disappearing to the developing world from the industrialized world. We're also seeing the disappearance of routine cognitive labor jobs. In other words, jobs that require repetitive mental tasks. Jobs that unless they're location dependent, can be done anywhere. So you think about accounting or computer programming. You think about customer support or payment processing and so on. Those jobs can literally be done anywhere in the world because the tools now allow us to move information and ideas across the globe at the speed of light. So what we're finding is that if your job is fungible, if it can be moved to another location, it probably will be moved to another location because of the wage differentials and standard of living differentials that exist throughout the world. So unless your job is location dependent, the person who drives a truck, the person who cuts your hair, the person who replaces the shingles on your house has to be right there. The doctor who checks you out at your annual checkup has to be right there. But many of these other jobs do not have to be. We're also seeing the replacement of much of cognitive work by software. Every time you fill out a form online, you've eliminated some number of data entry jobs. Every time you check in at a hotel or an airport with a kiosk, you've reduced the number of frontline service workers that you need. Every time you make your own airline reservation or hotel reservation online, the travel industry, the travel agents dwindle even further and so on. We're finding that if the Industrial Revolution was about replacing manual physical labor with machines, that the information revolution is increasingly about replacing cognitive labor with machines, computers. 
So what's left? What's left are non-routine cognitive jobs that also are non-fungible. That's what's remaining in the developed world. Those jobs require different sets of skills, different kinds of talents, higher levels of education. Those are the jobs that justify the wage premium that we've been paying people. They require regular doses of critical thinking and problem solving, creativity and innovation, complex communication skills, the ability to synthesize data and make meaning of it from a variety of sources, the ability to be innovative and entrepreneurial, to understand other cultures, and so on. This is the kind of work that's not easily replaced by software, that often is the kind of work that justifies those higher salaries and benefits of the westernized world. These changes are occurring very quickly, and yet they're only getting started. We're finding that many of these complex cognitive tasks that right now are embodied in individuals can now be broken up into component parts, segmented out so that each discrete piece can be done by a person with lower skills, often facilitated by software. In other words, advanced high-level service jobs, which make up as much as 60% of some of these westernized economies, are increasingly going to be broken up into smaller chunks, just like we did for manufacturing, and farmed out to other places where they can do those jobs with a little bit of training and assisted by software. So we're going to see the globalized piecework of service jobs, just like we did manufacturing. So this is a really big economic shift for us as we try and figure out what's the new economic landscape in which we're preparing our students and our graduates. What kind of jobs are they going to have? Are they going to be able to be competitive in a hyper-competitive global economy? When any job that can be sent somewhere else because of lower labor costs, because of software replacement and so on, will be, most likely. So that's the first big shift that we're living through, and I think we have to consider what our obligations are as schools to adequately prepare our graduates for that economic world. The second big shift that we're seeing is around our information landscape. Right? We're living through the reinvention of the dominant information landscape of our time, and we haven't done this to ourselves since we invented the printing press. The printing press was really about the disintermediation of access to information that others created. Before the printing press was around, most people didn't need to know how to read because they didn't have access to information. In information was expensive. It lived on manuscripts that were laboriously hand-copied. And only the wealthy and the elite and the powerful had access to information. To the extent that the average citizen needed to know something, they heard it from the king's messenger or the local priest and so on. What the printing press did was it made information available to the masses for the first time. And we could remove those third-party intermediaries between us and the information which meant that now we could access and read it ourselves if we, had, if we were literate, and we could decide for ourselves what it meant. And this was a big deal. This is what the Reformation was all about and so on. This was a huge societal shift. We're now living through a similar shift in our information landscape. We're seeing the disintermediation, not of access to information, but of creation of the information that others access. In other words, now anybody can be a publisher. Anybody can be a content creator. Anybody can be an author. We live in a frictionless world of publishing. The costs are so low to being a, a creator of text or audio or photographs or video these days that they're essentially zero. We all now have a voice. And we're finding that we, when we all now can have a voice, that we're having a go at it. And what's happening is that there's a lot more content out there than there ever has been before. And some of it's junk, and some of it's absolutely phenomenal because millions of minds that otherwise would have been ignored are now being backhauled into the global intellectual economy. It doesn't seem like a big deal that we all now have a voice, except that it's also been accompanied by the ability to find each other, to find the content that you want through search engines and keyword tagging and so on. So we can find the content that's of interest to us, and we can also find each other. We can find the people and the groups that are of interest to us. We're all now hyper-connected to content and to people and to organizations all across the world. And that's increasingly happening on mobile devices, which means that it's happening anytime, anywhere. And this new information landscape requires us to rethink 
some of our traditional thoughts and belief systems about the old information landscape, which was ink on paper. Now we're living in a world where there's digital bits floating up in the ether. They give us new affordances, and we have to ask, what are we going to do with that? How are we going to prepare our graduates for that world? So we have two big shifts that have occurred. This is what we've done to ourselves as society. We've created this new environment, this economic climate, this information landscape. And now the challenge for us is to determine what do we do about it at schools. And that's the problem that we have right now. Because what are we doing as schools, for the most part? We're doing this. <laughs> the vast majority of schools have not adapted themselves in any way, shape, or form, or in only marginal ways, to the economic and information landscapes of our time. What do these school environments look like? Well, we know that they were invented in a time in which three-fourths of the jobs that people went into were in manufacturing and agriculture, right, the late 1800s. Those same institutions, those same societal structures, those same pedagogical paradigms are now operating in a time in which three-fourths of the jobs in the westernized world are in upper-end service and creative class professions. These school systems emphasize a divergent culture of content, right? Where students are judged successful if they can spit back to us the right answer. These school systems put boundaries and boxes around our knowledge. We call them standards and standardized curricula, right? Failing to realize that we now operate in a boundless information landscape. These systems, as shown by research, emphasize factual recall and low-level procedural knowledge. Your average high schooler spends about 80 to 85% of his or her time on factual recall kind of work. Recent studies have shown that fifth graders are five times as likely to spend time on basic skills work as they are on problem solving and higher level reasoning skills. Your average first grader and third grader, 10 times as much time on basic skills than on problem solving and reasoning. This is deeply, deeply embedded into our school structures. Our classrooms look very much like the classrooms of 1890. The teacher is the focal point of the room. Students primarily sit in rows and columns. They primarily work at their desks, doing seat work or individual work. Occasionally, one gets to go up and display their knowledge at the front of the screen. We have to ask ourselves if the fundamental educational paradigm of 1890 is adequate for this new digitally connected globally connected world in which we now live. And if you think back to those three essential functions that schools serve to prepare our students to be socially functional, to be economically productive, to master the dominant information landscape of their time, we can see quite clearly that we have some disconnects. Disconnects that cannot continue to be maintained. So, we don't know what this all is going to look like down the road. We're at the forefront of the information revolution. We don't know what it's going to look like on the other end. But it's clear that there's some basic building blocks we're going to need. We're going to have to rethink curriculum and instruction and assessment. We're going to have to ask ourselves, what do we want kids to be able to do? And then work backwards from there. We're going to have to get a computer into every kid's hand. It's a digital world. We have to stop pretending that it's a paper and pencil world in schools. We're going to have to take better advantage of the affordances that online learning technologies bring to us in terms of expanding access to education to people that otherwise would not have access at all. We're going to have to focus on our leaders. One of the challenges that we face is that the people who are responsible for creating these new schooling paradigms leading us forward into whatever this new learning environments are going to look like. The ones that are, have the formal authority, whether it be administrative or legislative, in terms of 
making this stuff happen are often some of the least knowledgeable people about the digital and global world. And if the leaders don't get it, it's not going to happen. We're going to have to educate our communities about what this is all about. Right? We have mental models of what school should look like. We have lots of challenges ahead. So I'll leave you with a couple questions. We can see where this is all going. We don't know how it's going to all shake out yet, but it's very clear that what's going to happen next needs to be different than what's gone before. And as leaders, as educators, as policymakers, as parents, what's our moral imperative to create schooling environments that prepare kids for the next 50 years, not the last 50 years? And how brave are we going to need to be to make this happen? Right now, we're spending much of our time tweaking the status quo instead of inventing the new paradigm. And if we continue to do that, schools will be increasingly and perhaps dangerously irrelevant to the needs of students and families and society. Thank you.